everybody. Uh, it's a cold day. It's so welcome cold again. Cold day. Uh, yeah. Let me thank the audience for uh, coming this morning, uh, for the technical support. Uh, uh, Jonathan Dye, where are you? Uh, for uh, helping uh, set this up. Chris of Ottawa in the very back for uh, uh, helping to make this connection with the uh, Megan Arts Alliance. Um, um, this, is, uh, this event is hosted by the School of Liberal Arts and the Department of Media, Culture, and the Arts. We're just helping to put this on. Uh, Dr. Matthews, Dean of School of Liberal Arts, uh, thank you. Uh, we're glad to see you here this morning. Panelists, thank you very much. Um, this is a, a, a very strong panel of, of theater experts in middle of Georgia, um, and it's a, a fantastic opportunity to hear what we're going to hear. Um, I want to introduce one person this morning, Steve Murray, who will quickly introduce panel members as we uh, uh, move uh, through the presentation. Uh, Steve Murray is a critic in residence uh, with the Macon Arts Alliance, a very unique uh, role, and is with the Arts Matters uh, Project. He has been a writer for the Atlanta Journal and Constitution, um, has uh, uh, been in film and in theater, um, and uh, creative uh, enterprises that we all know and love, and um, is a columnist and uh, has worked as a columnist in film <coughs> for arts, uh, ATL.com. Um, I saw one of these panels, uh, I want to say earlier in the fall, at the Lanier Cottage, uh, which I thought was uh, very, very good. Um, as it looked at uh, literary criticism, um, and I know this morning's presentation will be equally strong. Uh, Steve? I'm going to jump right in. I'm sorry, it sounded a little giddy, but we're, we're <laughs> short on time because of the weather, uh, so we only have an hour rather than an hour and a half. Uh, so I just want to say thank you for coming. Art Matters is funded by the National Endowment for the Arts and the Big Foundation, for which we're very, very grateful. So today we're talking about the Middle Georgia uh, theater scene. Uh, avocational and academic theater, and we're talking to a couple of media people about their experience here, and the idea is that we talk about what we do and talk about ways to continue the conversation throughout Middle Georgia about how we make art, how we talk about art, how we cover it, where criticism is necessary or not or appropriate. So I'm just going to let people start talking. But starting from the left, we have Adam Lucia, who is the bureau chief for uh, uh, WMUM uh, and is our local correspondent for uh, Morning Edition. Um, what have we got? Larry Finley, longtime arts observer since the 70s, columnist with the Telegraph, who you knows his history here. John Jones of uh, Making Little Theater, theater manager there. Jim Crisp, Artistic Director of Theater Macon. Sydney Chalfa, theater professor, probably some of you know her, here at uh, Middle Georgia State College. And Fred Harden of, uh, I'm just losing my mind, uh, Warner <laughs> Robbins Little Theater. And now, I just wanted to ask people to talk about, uh, especially the four of you who make theater, who oversee theater, have been doing it for a while. I just, I don't want to hear necessarily a mission statement, but I'd like to get your thoughts about what theater does, what you do here, and what you think the purpose of it is for the community, for you, for audiences. So I'm being very, very vague, but I'd just like to hear your thoughts as a starting point. Uh, so if we can start with you, John. Okay. Do we, you, we don't need this, I, do No, we? I think we can be heard. This is just particularly with theater, theater people. <laughs> yeah, I think we're good. <laughs> well, you said specifically you don't need a mission statement, but I'm going to kind of uh, go against that in the sense that uh, Making a Little Theater was established in 1934, and it was, had a definite mission statement at that time because uh, it was the only game in town. It was the only game in, in the area. And I find that uh, in my job at Making a Little Theater, trying to carry on the traditions, it's important and I actually have to print it out and take it. I'm gonna have it tattooed on me at one point because I have, it has been criticized by some of the uh, more modernists about y'all need to change that mission statement. It's a little too antiquated because even the language is, but I believe in it. And I believe that if Make a Little Theater continues to keep their eye on the mission statement and, and you know, that's what we, our job is, we'll be fine. So let me read what they came up with in 1934 that we tend to, to go by. They called it the Macon Little Theater back then. We've dropped the the over the years. <clears throat> the Macon Little Theater is of the people, by the people, and for the people. And its object is to promote the drama 
and related arts and to become a real community asset through its efforts not only to provide entertainment for its members, and this is the part that I love that I won't change, but to be the embryo from which, as the sowing of the dragon's teeth by Jason, <laughs> that's Miss Piercy Chesney. That's her touch, and she's the grand dame of making a little theater since 1934. We'll spring directors, actors, playwrights, artists, set builders, designers, makeup experts, costumers, craftsmen all, in a common and eminently worthwhile community activity. And as long as I'm around, I'm not going to advocate changing this. So that will be, I'm sure, a time when they will update it and make it more concise and, and modern. But I think that that's kind of what Macon Little Theater was established for. And we have, over the years, provided opportunities for all of those areas locally. It doesn't say anything about bringing in, you know, professional theater and presenting it. That's not our mission. So I believe that if we stick with this and continue to try to do this for the community, Make a Little Theater should be on track with what it's supposed to do. Thank you. Jim? Well, uh, I think first and foremost, um, our mission is to provide entertainment. Uh, if it's not entertaining, no one's going to come, and they're really not going to care about what you're doing. I have loftier aspirations, which are often in conflict with that. <clears throat> which makes it difficult uh, to make some of the choices that I make as artistic director of the theater. But um, in a broader sense, one of, the, one of our missions is to maintain a, a professionally staffed theater as much as we are able within the confines of our budget. And uh, also as artistic director, I look to challenge um, our not only our audience, but our actors as well. Our actors and our talent pool are our life's blood. And if they're not uh, engaged and excited by what we're doing, our, it's most likely that our audience won't be either. Um, the guiding principle of my choices at the theater has always been uh, to select work that in one way or another celebrates the endurance and durability of the human spirit. So there are obvious things that I might not do, but there's an awful lot out there that I would do. And I think that um, that's been uh, a guidepost that has, uh, has served us well. Um, and the other aspect of what we do is, is uh, to be an incubator for young talent. Uh, it's a very important aspect of what we do and have been doing. And uh, not with the idea that everybody who, all the kids that participate in our youth actors company, that they would go on into professional work. That's not the point of it. Um, however, our track record of turning out uh, young people who are working professionally in many aspects of this business uh, is remarkable. It does make one wonder if there's something in the water here. Um, so, uh, and, I, and I will say, uh, it might be relevant at this point to say that my Strategy in selecting what we do uh, changed radically in 2008 when the economy tanked. Uh, and I realized that um, the, uh, the choices that I'd been making for the previous 20-some uh, years, uh, we built the theater. I built the theater on doing at least two or three um, uh, substantial dramatic pieces. And I knew that would have to change. Uh, people were uncertain, they were frightened, uh, they were the most uncertain economic times during my lifetime. So I realized that uh, we needed to do what Hollywood and Broadway did in the 1930s. If we were going to survive this economic downturn, we were going to have to really entertain people, engage them in that way, and give them a refuge from what was happening outside the doors. I realized that people did not really at this point, they didn't want to think, they didn't want to be depressed and they didn't want to be reminded they were going to die. But it didn't mean that we were going to have to just uh, do fluff. And uh, for instance, uh, during this time, uh, we did Much Ado About Nothing and made money on that show. So that's a, and that's a good example of finding quality, well-written material that will engage and entertain uh, and invite an audience rather than alienate an audience. Cindy. <coughs> What's well, very interesting to hear, Jim, because I'm an arts educator here at Middle Georgia State College, 
And I have a different mission statement for what I do. I feel like it's my job to prepare and present quality, challenging entertainment, yes, but pieces that challenge people to think critically and intensively. I really feel that way. And I do have a luxury being in an academic setting. We can do pieces that the community theaters can't do because they are, maybe they push the envelope a little bit more, and I'm proud of that. I think that's important for an academic setting. Um, I think it's very important to expose our students to new playwrights, to new movements out there, um, to what's going on in the arts in new, uh, new aspects. So that is the uh, approach I take. I teach and direct, and I try as much as possible to tie the pieces that we're directing to the classroom experience. But as I say, we try to challenge people to think very intensively and critically with what we're doing. Well, Warner Robins Little Theater uh, started about 1962 by a group of people that uh, felt like our small, small city at that time, and if any of you were around in 1962, you'll know that Warner Robins was really just beginning. The city is only about 70 to 75 years old now. Uh, but in 1962, Max Croft and uh, Vera Bayer and several other people felt like Warner Robins should have some kind of a theater group. And so they began one, and it started in an old dairy barn. They didn't even have running water in that building. And uh, the, they, they uh, were fortunate to get started with it, and uh, they did My Three Angels. And we just celebrated our 50th anniversary. We're in our 51st year now, which I think says an awful lot for our community out there that they really wanted and needed some arts, and they wanted some things that would allow people to do theater. Uh, community people, and it is definitely a community theater. Our theater from the beginning has been, uh, we seek directors from the community, we use people that have worked in our theater, or we invite people to come in. They submit plays, and from that, we choose our season. And then we know that that director is in love with that play, because they're going to do a better job with the show they prefer to direct. So our season comes from that. Um, I think the main purpose of our theater has been to provide an outlet for people that want to be artistic actors, set designers, costume, makeup, lighting, uh, all of those things uh, come straight from the community and everybody, I'm sure this is true of the other theaters as well, they all have day jobs. This is their passion. This is something they love and they do it because they really love it. And I think that's basically been our purpose, is to develop an audience, give our people something to come and see, and there's nothing more fun than to see somebody you know on stage. <laughs> and, uh, and, and community theater, uh, I think, provides that. And it gives that person an opportunity to not be so frustrated they couldn't go do professional work, but they can sure be a star in their own community. So uh, 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 a little fish in a big pond or a big fish in a little pond whichever way you look at it, uh, I think community theater provides that. And I'm just proud to say that we've been in business for 51 years. We bought our building. It's not huge when you come to see us, when people walk in and say, oh, it's so little. That's why it's called Little Theater. No, that's not the reason. <laughs> the good news is we got the building. We remodeled it. We purchased it. We have paid for it. And we've done it all through not any major fundraising, but through putting on shows. So we're completely out of debt, and that's something that I feel is very good for a community theater. That's huge. Uh, thank you all. Uh, I kind of want to throw this now to our two media representatives, because, you know, Adam, I know you've, you've covered theater in Boston and elsewhere, and then Larry, you've been covering uh, theater here for a long time. Uh, generally, these symposia are about, you know, professional arts and criticism and how they intermix. In this, in, in this area and with this panel and with the, the theater here, I think it's an interesting question about what place does criticism have? Is, is it something that can work in the same way as, as with other uh, organizations and other types of, of, of arts? Uh, or are there other ways to cover and 
keep the conversation going in the media. And I would just like uh, both of your perspectives on that. Adam, I know you had a story about getting in trouble. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Well, I would say that um, in my career, as I've done lots of arts reporting in lots of different cities, um, I have struggled with theater in three significant respects. One is how to effectively mic it. I'm a radio <laughs> reporter. Any radio reporter will talk, you talk to will say the worst, the hardest thing to effectively mic is theater, because everyone is so far away. So I've generally found that like, if you're doing a story about a production, you got to make them do a little scene just for you and so that you can get right up in their business and, uh, and get some nice on mic sound. But that's not, neither here nor there. Um, I would say as a reporter and not a critic, I've often struggled with um, the problem that I always feel like whenever I'm reporting on a, on, on a new artwork, particularly theater, I don't know why, I always feel like I have trouble staying within the bounds of strict reportage and not going over into criticism. Mm -hmm. I think that even if you don't explicitly do criticism in your story, there's going to be some implicit criticism. You're going to imply some kind of qualitative judgment on, on, uh, on the artwork. Um, which then leads to uh, the story that uh, Steve is alluding to where I got into trouble once where I was doing a story when I lived in Boston on uh, a local theater production in Cambridge of uh, uh, The Friends of Eddie Coyle, which is a great Boston crime novel. Um, you know, a, the, uh, the gentleman who was starring as Eddie Coyle lived down the street from me, and he was sort of a, a Cambridge, a Portuguese Cambridge street tough who looked really perfect in the role of Eddie Coyle, who's this sort of small-time Boston mobster. Um, but I remember I sort of, I remarked in my story about how he had a missing tooth. Like he had a really prominent missing tooth. And it, I remarked that it really worked with the, really worked with the, the character. And then uh, I did the story, played the story, went to the production. Afterward, all the cast was really pissed at me. <laughs> uh, you know, because they just, I guess they were sort of protective of their friend. And then, you know, the dude who played Eddie, uh, Apollo, came up to me and he said, you know, why'd you have to do that? You know, it was just like, I, 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 and then, you know, and this gets to sort of the question of how do you write about theater, and, and Larry, I'm sure you're going to speak to this, how do you write about theater in a relatively small community? Boston's not a small community, but sort of parts of it can function like small communities. And, you know, Paulo, I saw him every day in our tiny little uh, Whole Foods market in Cambridge where it's like you just sort of rub up against everybody as you're trying to reach your kale. Um, and just, you know, he'd scowl at me every time. I mean, it was just really rough. And so if you're, I think you struggle with when you're writing about local, the local theater and local art of any kind, really, to, to what extent do you grade on a curve, right? Um, do, you, do you hold it to, to, what's, to what standard do you subject it? And do you, how free can you feel to be un, unmitigated in uh, and a little bit cruel in the way that you look at it when you know that you're going to have to deal with those people as members of your community intimately. Uh, I'm sure, Larry, you've dealt with that quite a few times writing for the Telegraph. Well, more so in the, in the past. At one time, the Telegraph reviewed virtually every theatrical performance that took place in this community. And uh, I, you know, I, I, I feel a bit like... Uh, the Telegraph can take some credit for for uh, creating a, a tremendous tremendous growth in the in the popularity of uh, of theater. But but uh, you know Adam uh, is is quite right. It's a it's a ticklish uh, it's a ticklish uh, mission. Uh, at one time, uh, James Palmer, who is currently the the publisher of Megan Magazine, at one time he was the he was the features editor and. Before the theater season would start, he would gather together all the the the, the, the reviewing cadre from the from the community, and and you know he picked people who had some uh, some experience, uh, oftentimes you know professional experience. Uh, back when I had a full head of hair, I I worked full time in the in the in the theater in. Uh, uh, in, uh, in Florida, for example. But anyhow, that we had professional productions that came through town and we had community productions. Some community theaters were old and established. Some were, were fledglings. 
And of course, we had collegiate productions. And James had been the sports editor uh, long before he became the, the features editor. And like many telegraph writers, uh, Ed Grismore, for example, who uh, fled the sports department and, and went on to other things. But James pointed out that, like in sports coverage, if in a in a in a high school football game, if if a kid dropped what would have been the winning pass, the writer simply said the pass went incomplete. Whereas if this were a big time collegiate game or a professional game and somebody dropped a pass in the end zone, then you would say, you know, Leroy Smith or whatever his name is, you know, gave the game away. Christmas came early for the Falcons and so on. And, and that person was, was subject to, uh, to considerable uh, humiliation in the, in the press. And, and James said, this is, you know, when we're dealing with community theater, we're, we're dealing with you know, the analogy being high school athletes. And, you know, basically, if we can't say something nice, then perhaps that individual will go unmentioned uh, in the review. <laughs> but he will not, he will not be damned. Uh, and that, that, was, uh, that was our policy, and it, and it worked, worked pretty well. It did not always work because the people who run the Grand Opera House were not always happy when a professional show came to town and the Telegraph's reviewer said, stay home. This is not, this is not as, as, as well done as, as much of our local work. If you want to see good theater, go see our local work. Well, this did not sit well, of course, with the, with the officials at the Grand Opera House. There's, there's a lot of money. Uh, a lot of money involved, and of course, in recent years we haven't we haven't reviewed uh, the local productions. Uh, the only thing that gets reviewed is the uh, is the Macon uh, Symphony, and I think that's uh, uh, that's a, a great loss. And I've I've suggested to anybody who will listen, and and so far no one has, but that the uh, the, the Center for Collaborative Journalism ought to uh, educate. Students with uh, with with some interest and uh, and uh, perhaps uh, future interest even in theater to uh, to let them replace the Telegraph's former uh, cadre of of in-house reviewers and you know if the news hole is not big enough to to handle uh, uh, printing those reviews to at least make them available on the Telegraph's uh, website because I do think that that. Uh, that reviewing plays a large role in, uh, in, the, in the growth and, and, and prosperity of, of theater in the community. And, you know, I've, I'm listened with a sympathetic ear to, to these, these mission statements, but, you know, I understand the need to make money and keep the lights on and all that, but by the same token, theater is a, is a grand cultural tradition that goes back thousands of years and you know we're a part of that even in our in our little way right here. And uh, and sometimes uh, you know uh, somebody needs to stand up and say, hey, hey, this is uh, this is uh, this is important, uh, not just not just to our community, but but our to our cultural heritage. Let me and break in there, Larry, because this is a good point. I mean, you have a very tangible idea. I think you know we do have the Center for Collaborative <coughs> Journalism. I think that's a really specific idea of how, you know, dealing with the fact that there is a shrinking, ever-shrinking news hole to get coverage, to get criticism of, of theater. Facing that reality, facing the reality that theater here is non-professional and you have to find ways to write about theater, remembering that nobody sets out to make bad art. My question is, because part of what Art Matters is trying to do with art forms of all sorts uh, this year is, find ways to foster and continue the conversation in the community about what we do here. So I'm, I just want to sort of throw it out there. If anybody has ideas about what's being done well right now, what we need more of, whether it's feature stories, whether it's new, uh, TV, whether it's blogging, uh, any ideas you have about things that could happen to get the conversation going. And I know you all support each other's, other's theaters as well. I know in all your programs you do that. So if you have any ideas, I'd love to hear them. May I? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, you want to go? <coughs> well, 
I feel very strongly that um, anyone who's going to review theater has to have a passion for theater, first of all. And we have lots of people in Macon who have a passion for theater. But those people need to have training in theater to review theater. And I hope I don't offend anybody, but I don't think a freshman who's had acting and theater appreciation is equipped to review theater. Absolutely. I think it takes more training than that to be uh, an effective theater reviewer. And a lot of exposure. And a lot of exposure to theater, absolutely. Um, and I think what you said about feature stories, I like to do a lot of plays by new American writers because they tell us who we are and they tell us what we're thinking about and they're telling us what we worry about as Americans and how we solve those problems. I'd like to see feature stories about the writers more education for the community about the craft of theater. Who's writing? Why do they write? What difference does it make to us? Um, something I think we do a good job with feature stories now about what's going on and who's in the show. And that helps sell tickets. And that's wonderful because theater is terribly expensive to do, as we all know. We were talking before the panel started about how do you fund your theater. Theater is expensive. And those feature stories we have now are great helping to sell tickets. But as an arts educator, as I said earlier, I think it's very important to educate the public what's being written and why did we choose this show and what does it have to do for the community. Mm -hmm. Is that something you can do at the theater yourself as far as like talkbacks or, is, I mean, obviously that is something you yeah. can do, but it's almost find a way of doing that outside the walls of right. the to have this conversation. We're getting ready, a plug here, I'm sorry, to open a show. <laughs> I, you know, I'm Shame. shameless. You know, because I want all of you to come on the 13th of February. <laughs> nice. Thank you, John. Yes. I really want to work your posters. Rabbit Hole by David Lindsay Bear. It won the Pulitzer in 2007. Beautiful, complex show about loss and redemption. It's a beautiful script. And after, it's, it's about a family that loses a child and how they find their way back after that. Um, one night after the show, we're having someone who's a, a death expert. Is that, I don't know what else her title is. Or have a talk back session with the audience about um, how people, we're not trying to counsel people, we're not trying to do that at all, but how did people cope uh, like the people in this play? Is this play honest? Um, have we done a good job of being honest in our presentation of it? And I'm, I've, as an arts educator, again, I believe very strongly in trying to educate as much through the art form as we can. And so the question is how to make that happen outside the theater, because yes. you've, got the, you've got your audience right. there already. Right. So, so John, what were you? Well, I think I, it was important to me what you said about uh, get the dialogue started and get the word out. In my opinion, we've got a gap, a cultural gap with uh, maybe it's a generational thing, I don't know, about the love and understanding and appreciation of live theater. And I find it harder to draw, and, and like Jim, you know, you have to think about your shows and what will entertain and will this bring in a younger audience. Making a little theater by tradition has an older audience. Uh, our, our average member's age is 60 to 80. And so we want to keep those people happy, but we're trying to reach other people. And so anything, if a review, I don't know how I feel about reviews. I've been doing theater since 1970, and I was of the ilk that people used to stay up till 2 in the morning after a little theater production to go get the telegraph. And, and sometimes it was brutal, and sometimes feelings did get hurt. But my attitude was, well, you put yourself up there, and you know, but now I look at it like whatever generates interest, and if, if reviewing, whether it be more of promotion, because that's what we really need is after the fact. See, Larry, I never understood why the symphony had that review, because uh, it was over. And so, it, John, neither do I. <laughs> so if you read it, it's like, oh, that was great, but I can't go to it. And in our position of college and community theater, if you had something come out, people would read it. There were actually people I know of for a fact in the 70s and 80s because attendance was always down opening and the opening Friday and Saturday. They waited for the review, and that helped them decide if they wanted to go see the show. And that's not good because some people would say, well, this reviewer didn't like it, so we're not going to go. But back to my point, anything that creates a new interest in the community, and again, I'm not saying it's necessarily generational, but I think the idea of live theater is not as uh, prominent and exciting in Macon because people have so many other things to do. 
Netflix always comes to mind, you know, and things like that that can take your, take your interest out of the uh, live theater experience. So whether it be reviews, whether it be uh, discussions afterwards, which I think are wonderful, uh, no matter what it is, because sitting on this panel, I realize how rich we are. We have the gamut here from traditional theater, from community-type theater that appeals to, to more daring. Uh, Jim, you're, can I mention what you're doing next? The, the next uh, avenue? I think you, I'll do that. You do that. <laughs> Tell them about that. I am so excited about that show, and yet I don't know that Making More Theater was done. So anyway... Anything to reestablish this interest and love of what we are so rich in in this community would be fine with me. I think the thing that we have to accept as, as theater professionals and people that love the theater and care about it um, is that this is not just a, a local trend of trying to get people into the theater. It's a national trend. The NEA just did um, a study, a very um, well-respected study. It's shocking that in 10 years from 2002 to uh, 2012, in 10 years, the attendance at non-musical theater at plays dropped from, and these are shocking statistics, it was 12.3% of American adults, 12.3% of American adults attended the theater in, in 2002. That dropped to 8.3% in 2012. Now what's even more disturbing is that in that same time period, for the first time since 1986, attendance at musical theater, which has been the bread and butter, also dropped. Dropped from uh, 17 some percent to 15 percent. That's a huge red flag. And the other thing that I think that we have to accept and deal with and respond to is that we live in an on-demand society. In 2004, iPads or iPhones were novelty, tablets were really uh, still a little bit science fiction, but right now, what we're competing with are people who can bring whatever they want to their tablet or whatever device they're holding in their hands. And we also know, to the extent that we can track this, is that most people are not looking at theater on those. They're looking at films and lots of other things, and, and, and I think as theater professionals and, and people who care about the arts, we want to leave a legacy that, that is better than um, uh, American Idol and six-pack abs. Uh, I the, think this is I interesting think. because what you're talking about is, is simultaneously the challenge but also the yeah. strength of what we're doing here, which is my like, next point. this is, uh, well, go ahead. My, my next point is, we have something that they don't have, right. and we have got to market it better. <clears throat> I don't think we have to do it differently. I don't think we have to jump on the tech bandwagon. But what we have to do is educate people, convince people, tell people that what they can get in a live performance, they cannot get anywhere else. They cannot anywhere else have the experience that they have sitting, particularly in an intimate space, and most, most theaters today are intimate spaces. They can't get that experience of sitting six feet away, eight feet away, or 10 or 12 feet away from the bed in Streetcar Named Desire where Stanley Kowalski rapes Blanche. And, and you, you can't get that experience anywhere else. The hell of a um, marketing campaign, though. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And, and what we need to do is market ourselves more creatively, more imaginatively, that resonates some way with, uh, with a wider audience. It also relates to the material that we choose to do. Um, Jonathan it always Dye, goes back to programming. To break in, because Jonathan Dye, we make an arts alliance. And some of us were on a little check-in conference call last week, not all of us were, but Jonathan had a very interesting analogy uh, where, where you have like the farm to table movement in, in agriculture and in produce and in restaurants now. So. The question is, is there a, an analogy for theater? How do, we, how do we make this the same sort of thing? Homegrown and handmade. Right. Well, that's, that's the key, right? It's, it's, it's homegrown material. You know, I can, t I can tell you, as a journalist, certainly, and also as an audience goer, I, just, I have zero interest in a play that was written someplace else by somebody else <laughs> and has been performed elsewhere. I, none. none. I, my interest would be exclusively be in pl original plays that are written here. 
and hopefully deal with issues that are unique to this place, have sense of place. I think you might be an outlier on that, though. I mean, don't you think some people just want to have like something that's mass marketed that they've heard of already? I mean, I think I'm with you on this thing. I don't well, know. I will tell you from the point of view for us, I've noticed that if a play has a name already, then we'll have an audience. Right. And that's if we do a show that nobody's heard of before, <coughs> then the audience is a lot is more slim. Uh, it, it's funny because they don't always want something new. Mm -hmm. They want something they've seen a hundred times before. And uh, I mean, I, it, it's evident sometimes when we're doing certain shows, I'm sure you all experience the same thing. I don't know why they're that way. I wish we could educate them better, but we just somehow cannot seem to do it. I well, think Adam's um, hit on something that, that's really important that we are overlooking is that we have so many stories of our own that we're not telling, mm -hmm. that are not being told, and there is an immediate audience for those stories. Uh, can I toss in here, a good example of that is years ago, and I don't know whether they're still doing it or not, but Swamp Gravy down in oh, Caldwell, yes. Georgia, yes. was a hot, hot yeah. ticket, and it was so hot that they actually started touring. They came to Macon, they came to Warner Rocks, they came everywhere, and they did their little stories, and those were all stories of local people that uh, they had brought in a professional playwright or someone to help them with. And uh, I don't, how many of you have been to Colquitt down there, to their actual theater? Yeah. It's a wonderful space. It became and, a cottage industry. Uh-huh. And, and, and gift and, shops. And it's damn yeah. good. I mean, yeah. that's what's wonderful it's about it. And it's all local yokels yeah. doing it. And, and it's wonderful to sit in there and get the feeling of all those lives. And, and it wasn't um, even done in a theater, was it? It was done in kind of a... Well, it's, it was an old car dealership that they had transformed into a theater. Well, the space was designed specifically yeah. for, for that. that. Uh -huh. yeah. And which is perfect. I mean, it's yeah. great that when they can do it. And I don't know whether they are still doing it or not. I haven't heard anything about it in a good while. I hope they haven't lost it. Has anybody here tried anything like this? Tried some sort of, you know, local homegrown thing? We, we did the, the Anjet Lyle story, which in Macon, Georgia, everybody knows about. And based on the fact that it was local lore, uh, we did it three separate times over a period of years because they kept coming. <laughs> and, you know, it was just kind of like, okay. Well, we've been doing something at the Little Theater that I think is interesting. Uh, uh, a group of our people that are not necessarily theater people, but they, they, they've gotten involved with the theater because they just fell in love with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, we do a, a fundraiser where uh, it's a, a locally written play. Uh, it's not been done before. It only lasts about an hour. And it's pay what you want to pay when mm -hmm. you leave. Yeah. We've made about $1,000 every time we've done it for a couple of nights. and, and it, so we're doing it again next year. I mean, it, it amazes me that people have come out and when they leave, they drop us a nice little sum. And the show is good. It's, it's rehearsed away from our major productions. I mean, it's just put together very quickly, a simple set, everything. And they have about a week uh, in the theater when they actually have the time to put it together. And uh, it's been surprising to us that it has caught on as well as it has. The last show we did, Soft Book, is written by the, uh, the husband of an uh, a English professor down at Middle Georgia in Cochrane. Mm. Uh, and uh, it was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. uh, expectations, I, I don't know what the expectations are when they come to see this, but they seem to lead happy. <laughs> it seems like a matter of, of community, getting the community in and giving them ownership mm -hmm. in a way, mm -hmm. if that makes sense, please. And they, I say something. Um, we have a creative writing minor here at Middle Georgia State, and we're hoping to start offering a playwriting class in that, and hopefully we'll see more of these plays coming out of that class. I really hope so. But uh, as I said earlier, I'm very big into project theater, and some of you may remember um, about 10 years ago we did Lonely Planet by Stephen Dietz, which is a play about friendship in the age of AIDS, and we ran a chairs project. The play is chairs keep appearing on stage and they all represent someone lost to AIDS. And we ran a chairs project where we talked to people in Macon who've lost people to AIDS and said, would you like to put a chair in the show? And we had 80 chairs, this was in 93 when you didn't talk about AIDS a lot in Macon, Georgia. We had 80 chairs put in that show for people lost to AIDS. The community was invested in that show, very big. 
because when they came, and you could hear when those shut, when those chairs came out every night on that stage, you would hear gasp <coughs> because people would say, "I know whose chair that is. I realize who that belongs to." Um, That's a story I would have done. Yeah. It was a beautiful show, and the irony is it was by Stephen Dietz. I don't know how many, I, I'm very proud. I introduced Stephen Dietz to this community in Macon, Georgia. Uh, we brought him in for an internship. Stephen was an unknown playwright at the time. Mm -hmm. He's now the most produced living American playwright. I'm very proud of that. And Jim's done shows by Stephen now. You've done two by Stephen. He's very prominent now. But we brought him in, and that was one of his first plays. But it was a beautiful project. We also did a show by Stephen God's Country, which is about hate groups in America. And uh, it's it's really a gritty show about hate projects in America. And um, we ran, uh, I, we had displays all over the lobby. Uh, we went to, we called the Southern Poverty Law Center. And they furnished us with all kinds of information. We found out about hate groups 10 miles from here of the kind that are covered in the show. And so we had displays all about that. My husband kept saying, I hope we don't have a cross burned on our lawn while you're directing this show. <laughs> you know, and I said, I don't think, uh, I just said, I don't think Macon is that tuned in. To, I said, I think they're too apathetic to burn a cross on our lawn. Well, when you did Angels theater. in America, you didn't have any, I was waiting for the yeah. protests out there, but you didn't. <laughs> yeah, we did Angels in America, and I'm very proud of that. We did parts one and parts two. And, um, and we had to talk at length to the administration about that play, because that's a very um, mature, mature is not the right word, it's a very controversial play. And I was very proud, we ran each performance, part one and part two, uh, 14 nights, and I think for part one we only had five people leave, and for part two I think, we, I, I kept numbers, we only had four people leave, and I was very proud of that. Well, that's one, one over. Yeah. Well, that's why, I mean, that's why having the, as you say, the luxury of, of Academia. I have a luxury being it's, an academic theater. But that's why theater. you need to be doing yeah. what you're doing. Yeah. Because the other theaters, they can't do it. They're going to mm -hmm. lose their shirts. I have exactly. a question because I just don't know this. Do you get a sense that your audiences travel from theater to theater? Or do you just have people go to the same place at just that place? Or do people no, go theater think, all around? Uh, I think theater goers are theater goers. Right. And I think they travel around. Now, I do think that each theater group probably has a a very dedicated patronage, but there's also that group, they just love theater, they want to see it okay. anywhere, no matter who's doing it, and I know a lot of people who do that, and, and uh, I think that's a good thing, I encourage that with our audience, and, and encourage it when I speak to people. I'm always promoting the, what we have in this community in terms of theatrical resources, and uh, and that if they're not getting out to see what's being done, they're really missing something. Now, I agree. We feel the same way. In fact, you know, Jim's, I was going to say when Jim has successes, all of his shows are successes. And so I'm just as proud of that because what he's doing is exciting audiences. And if those audiences are excited about theater, well, they're going to come to the other theater. Mm -hmm. So we really enhance and help each other by putting theater out there that, that people come see because you know, we're just all together in creating this product, and so it doesn't matter where it's being sold. Mm -hmm. If we can create the interest in, you know, that show was so good, I need to see, then they'll come see ours too. So we're, we're working this together. What well, I would love to see, I'm sorry, just, just one thing, is this panel, for one, for one thing, thank you again for being here. It's an incredibly talented panel and very busy, and just, I would love to see this panel happen again, but at a time when theater lovers, could come together and we could really have a conversation and actually find a way to have that conversation literally. Like, what are we doing right? What would you like to see? What would, you know, it's just a thought. I don't know how that could happen or if you think it's a good idea. I think it is a good idea and it definitely right. could happen. Yeah. Just don't do it Super Bowl weekend. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they won't come. Or the George Florida game. Right, exactly. They, they find other things. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, as speaking as a person not from Macon, the one thing I say is, uh, I tell people all the time, I said, you know, if, if you love theater, don't tell me there is nothing to do in central Georgia. Mm -hmm. Because between the backlot players, Theater Macon, Macon Little Theater, Wesleyan College, Mercer University, Macon State College, Warner Robins Little Theater, Perry Players, and there's something in Fort Valley now. Damn it, there's something out there. Right. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is get out there and find it. The Did one thing we do on? have that I'm very pleased about is uh, Jonathan puts out his uh, weekly uh, 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 email 
and the ovations, and then we have out and about, and if people get that calendars, if they are serious about doing something, they can find it. Because, I mean, we could even always go up to um, Georgia uh, College and State University. They've got a great theater program going on up there, only uh, an hour for Warren Robins, uh, 30 minutes from Macon. There is plenty at uh, Barnesville, I mean uh, Griffin, there is so much middle Georgia going on that if you really want to do something, if you want to see some theater, if you want a concert, if you want something, it's there. We even have good theater in our cemeteries, don't we, Suzanne? Yes. <laughs> I mean, who can, who can lay claim to that? Environmental theater. That's it. Now, now normally on these uh, symposia, I would, we would be able to talk for an hour and then open it up for Q&A for like half an hour, but we're on a truncated schedule. So <clears throat> I think I'll go ahead and just open it up to any questions, any Q&As that might be out there while we have these talented people to talk. Anybody? Um, I want to ask, uh, media representatives again, could you talk a little bit about uh, what makes you want to cover certain things, like what is it about that theaters can do to, like what are they, what makes theater interesting to you as someone who's reporting on it, um, as far as what they're doing, like you mentioned when we talked about Farm Table, which I'm a big advocate for that theory, because I've seen things like there's a French theater group in Atlanta called Twin Head Theater. They, they don't have a theater building, but they are a troupe. They're all young, under 30, and they write all their productions. They do live theater, and they also make videos and put them online. But the thing that's interesting is they tell a lot of stories about it now. They don't tell stories about California. They don't tell stor stories about England. or any, They're telling stories about their communities that they live in. And I'm really interested in that. But I'm also interested to hear from the media about like what's interesting about community theater that can make uh, you want to cover it, and or what can they do to tell stories about the community that the media can't tell? Well, I'll tell you. Well, Jonathan, you touched on a whole whole lot of stuff there. My interest is, you know, my obligation is is not to John and Jim and so on. My obligation is to the the, the newspaper readers, and you know, uh, a, a famous guy. Uh, uh, former head of the NEA named, named uh, uh, Joya, Goya, Joya, that's a, uh, but he wrote a famous book called Can Poetry Really Matter? And, and sometimes I feel that way about, about theater. And my job is to tell the audience why this is important. And, you know, I, I love when Stephen Dietz came to make and, and, and the fact that you know, we're interested in doing new original works, but by the same time, when a student takes a theater class, he reads, you know, the great classics of the stage. And, you know, I would think, I hate to think that my children may go to their grave without ever having a chance to see some of these works on stage. So we really need more theaters doing more plays, not, not fewer theaters. Like John's getting ready to do Our Town, which is, you know, arguably probably one of the ten greatest uh, dramatic works ever uh, ever written uh, and so you know I don't know the answer to your to your to your question because we're you know these these <clears throat> these panelists are on on a tightrope and uh, and and they have an obligation to uh, to serve to serve many masters and uh, and one of them of course is uh, uh, is is uh, is right uh, is right here so how do we support new works? How do we revere the classics? And how do we keep the seats full to keep the lights on, you know? I, mean, uh, I have an example. Actually, Adam, you worked on this with uh, Grant Blankenship. You know, actually, speaking of the Spirits on October, the, uh, the annual wonderful performance history pageant uh, at Riverside uh, Cemetery, there was a great piece about that that was done on radio and in the Telegraph itself. And so that was a very good example of, again, embracing community. It, it was, I thought, a wonderful. Yeah, because it was, it, was it was not only a piece of theater that was conceived and written and performed locally, but also had to do with issues that are unique to our little place of the world, you know? And so to me, I mean, when Grant suggested that to me as a story, it was a slam dunk. That was a no-brainer. I mean, that's, that's a story. Uh, a, a similar example that I can give you, Jonathan, would be a, a, 
uh, a, a big, I think we, the, I used to produce a daily talk show in, in Boston, and we did a whole hour around the subject of this one play that was about um, sort of the suburban dream of home ownership among African American families in Boston where like most cities you're actually seeing uh, a trend of black suburbanization that is in many ways sort of mirrors white suburbanization in the 50s and 60s. Um, and, and this young, young black playwright had written this just phenomenal piece of work about that issue and about her own family's experience with it. <laughs> and he's a theater guy, he should, you know. <laughs> you, gonna, you gonna pull out a cough drop with a loud rapper next? <laughs> Uh, and to me, and that was that was a slam dunk. I mean, that was that was a story. Now, you know, that would interest me. That's what interests me as a journalist. What gets butts in the seats? Gosh, I don't know. That's a really difficult thing. I hear what you're saying that, um, you know, you want your children and your students to have the experience of going to a theater and seeing Stanley in his wife beater. You know. 10 feet away from him, you know? But fact of the matter is, is that, look, I love Richard III. Richard III is one of my favorite cultural items of any kind in the universe. I can go on Netflix, and there's like three Kenneth Branagh, you know, versions. One's a movie, one's a play. I mean, there's like 15 different ways I can watch Richard III online. And is, the, is it really so much better to see it in person? Um, I'm not sure if that's worth it. And I think that, especially for me, uh, uh, in my, if I compare the experience that you guys have running theaters to my own experience of running a radio station, um, which to a great extent subsists itself on the de facto monopoly it has enjoyed, enjoyed on the distribution of national content, that is morning edition and all things considered out of Washington, D.C., um, that is eroding as, 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 as a business model because increasingly people can listen to This American Life on their podcast and they don't need to get it from my radio station. Therefore, in order to justify my organization's existence, I have to be local, I have to be place-based. Um, and in the, in the short run, the extent to which we've, I mean, we've made an enormous investment in local programming at our station in the last year and a half, um, to the extent that we've done that, we have some evidence even, not even so much from our station, but other stations around the country. It hurts you, actually. It costs you audience. People don't want to hear local news very much. They want to hear what's going on in Libya. Um, it's, it's going to cost us some degree of market share in the short run. We hope that over the long term it will gain us, or at least give, give their, at least, um, result in there being some reason for our institution to stick around in the future. Um, and I, I see a lot of analogies between our experience with that and the experience of local theaters. Can I um, speak to that a little bit? Because I grew up, guys, with a father who could not read and write. I grew up with a mother who only got to the 10th grade. I was not exposed to the arts. Thank God I had some elementary school teachers in my little podunk town of mill workers who exposed me to some arts. They brought in pictures of famous paintings for me to look at. I liked to draw, and uh, there just wasn't an art teacher. There wasn't a music teacher. There wasn't any of those things for me. Every grade level put on a show uh, once a month for the PTA. Okay, that was the only theater I saw that was live. I was hungering for it. The one plus that my dad did for me is he carried me to the movies because we could go to the movies after he'd worked in the mill uh, for 40 hours all week and standing up. And we went to the movies. And that was the, my window on the world because I grew up in a community that everybody was either farmers or mill workers. I didn't have contact with college professors and doctors and lawyers. The only time I saw a doctor was when he was off of working on me. You know, I, I didn't have that in my community. Everybody was ignorant. Everybody was normal and average. I grew up with no art. When I got into high school, thank God I had some teachers who played me a record of Camelot and I found out about Broadway shows. I didn't know they existed except for in the movies. That was so foreign from me. I had no idea that it was real. And suddenly, my world began to open up. And I realized with this eighth grade teacher that I wanted to go to college. I wanted to be a teacher. 
And so when I began to see live performances, it was a high school play put on by the high school kids. Well, I just thought that was the grandest thing ever. The junior and senior play. I got in them. And then I got to college. And thank goodness, we had a great little theater at Western Carolina. It was Western Carolina College then. And I went to the theater every night that they ran a play. I had friends, they had their tickets, but they wouldn't use them. So I would get their tickets and I would go and sit through Anything Goes every night it was running, or Bus Stop every <laughs> night it was running, or Far Country every night it was running, because I had never seen it before. And I was so hungry for it, I could not wait to get in there. But those theater people were so weird, I, couldn't, I didn't want to be a part of that at that point. A little did I realize that I was as weird as they were. So anyway, by the time I got out of college, I was already set to be a teacher, and I taught for 41 years. Uh, I got involved with the community theater, and that opened up a whole world for me that I had never, never experienced. I got to see theater, I got to see, this is why I say, yes, it does make a difference to see it live and in person and right there and see a person standing on that stage in that light and in that set and in that costume. There's something wonderful about that that, I'm sorry, a pad does not do, a television does not do, a movie does not do, and I love my movies. So when I taught sixth grade for all those years, I taught my children about theater and I made puppets and I did all kinds of things with them to try to get them involved with, with acting and doing something and reading out loud and using your voice and doing something different. And thank God I have some students that did catch it. And they go on and they say, you know, thank you Mr. Harden for introducing me to those things because I'm thankful that I had teachers that did the same thing. I'm sorry, I just had to say that because well, you know, it makes a difference. Amen. Get that recorded and put it out there. Yeah. But here's, here's what I'm getting today, and, and it gives me hope. You know, we're all in the same boat, it's, and everybody knows that we say it, putting butts in seats versus art, and we have to do both. And we're doing the best we can. Everybody is. And we're well balanced, and we offer something in this middle Georgia area that I think is so unique to towns. All right, I'm seeing from this. Okay, not not putting it on the media, but you know when the when the papers downsize and they get smaller and smaller, the sports page never changes. Mm -hmm. You know, there's always four or five pages of sports because people are always going to. Why can't we? As a community, just like there's a community right, effort right now to, to improve downtown, to consolidate and all that, why can't the uh, local arts, particularly theater, become an issue community-wise mm -hmm. so that we don't have to work so hard at grabbing the audiences and that maybe there's something that can go on in this community to celebrate the theater. I mean, I can see a whole theme billboards and you know what the richness that we have stories interviews Fred's uh, story and maybe the community can kind of wake up and all of us won't have to work so hard with the mechanics of guys we're giving you something that is so important why don't you come try it so I'm hoping that maybe that can evolve and that we need to find ways of doing that maybe even well, get involved like first Friday or something mm -hmm. have ways to show people what you're doing. We're going to be around looking at everything. I'm sorry, are you going to say something? There is something absolutely spiritual about getting a bunch of people in a room and turning the lights down and exposing them to the Amen. same story together. Mm -hmm. And you can feel it in an audience. It's a spiritual experience. I think of shows I've done, which were some of the most spiritual experiences of my life. Amazing. But one of the problems I have with my students is that theater is expensive. My students don't have money. And they can afford to come to place at Middle Georgia State College because their student activity fees support our program. Thank they get two free tickets to everything we do. But if I ask them in my, some of my classes, they are required to go to two outside productions a year, I mean a semester, and they say, <clears throat> I don't have the money for it. And I'm not doubting them. These are kids who work 40 hours a week and go to class. 
And I know for some of them the money is a problem. But I know for the theaters they can't lower their prices either because they need the money to keep producing. It's a kind of like a catch twenty two. Y'all don't do the voucher system anymore, do you? Because we no, the voucher vouchers. system is no longer in place. It was such place. a wonderful thing. Right? It was a vouch it was a wonderful situation. It's no longer in place. Um, but I see that a lot. And my students, Jim very kindly lets us come to his dress rehearsals for free. And um, my students go see things there to dress rehearsals. And they know it's a dress rehearsal, but they come out and they are so excited because they've seen a show somewhere else besides Macon State College, Macon, I'm sorry, Middle Georgia State College. Um, I'm sorry. I have sorry. a problem with that too. I'm learning, I'm learning. <laughs> mm -hmm. but, um, it's a, it's a, and, but I tell you one thing I'm very proud of is that the students who we train and work with here work in all of these theaters. And I'm very proud of that. They work in your theater, they work in yours, they work in gyms. And I'm very proud of that because I see them, it's not just a school situation. They see this as a community endeavor. Gray Henson is at the Fox Theater yes. this weekend in the Book of Mormon yeah, there's well, a in the lead role. Well, I hate to do it, but uh, because of the weather, I'm afraid we're going to have to wind this up. So I want to thank our panel again very much. And thank you all. <laughs>